In this talk, dear listeners, I want to speak of the intimate connection between radio waves and brain waves, and particularly of the imaginaries that enabled this intimate connection. And with this word uh, imaginaries, I mean the thoughts that could be thought, the thoughts that could be thought in a particular time and place. And of course, here tonight, I'm specifically interested in wireless imaginaries. And I'm interested in a vision of brain radio in the early decades of the 20th century. And in your hands, I hope, I don't, I don't have one, but Uh, dear listeners, uh, is a little visual guide to my talk this evening, a Bilderbeilage. Uh, when the first radio guides were published in the 1920s, images were also frequently accompanying radio and were promoted as a, a visual arm for radio listening. So this, this thing. Um, besides these images, you will hear the sound of my voice. And you will not hear the sounds of five things that I will mention tonight. First, the sound of Jean dancing to the music in her brain. Second, the sound of hissing and fizzing red hot metal submerged in cool water. Third, the sound of rain falling down on a tin roof. Fourth, the sound of the voice of the favorite scientist of the BBC, and fifth, the sound of brainwaves relayed through outer space. So let us now turn to image number one, a copy of a newspaper article, which was published in the US in 1926 and entitled, Why Radio May Have Uncovered a Sixth Sense, Science Now Investigating Cases of Broadcast Programs Being Picked Up Unaided by the human nervous system. The piece is typical of popular science reporting at the time, um, presenting its readers with a number of discoveries on the connections between brains and radios. Such connections were intuitively and speculatively made, both in the text and on the page. We see images of a microphone printed right next to an illustration of a brain, and a phonograph of a woman's head overlaid with an illustration of radio equipment. In this way, brainwave broadcasting was not just a turn of phrase in a newspaper's text, but it was also visually materialized on paper. Starting the article is a strange case of brain radio. So in, in this article, the piece tells the story of 60 people that had recently contacted radio station WOR to report about peculiar incidents of radio reception. These listeners stated that even without a radio set present, they could clearly hear broadcasted radio programs as if they were receiving the programs in their head. One New York-based letter writer by the name of Jean Montgomery reported that she had been able to, quote, dance at times to the mu music she heard, unquote. Responding to these reports, the director of WOR radio station, Mr. Hollywood McCosker, had started an investigation into mental radio receptivity, and he proposed that the nervous system of some people had perhaps become especially sensitive to radio waves. The article also mentions American radio engineer Charles Willis, who, who went as far as to claim that through generations of broadcasting and radio use, mankind would eventually develop a universal sixth sense or radio sense that would allow the nervous system to directly pick up radio broadcasts. So what is striking in this popular science article is that the fact of hearing radio in your head was not immediately thought of as something irrational. Instead, the radio sense is here put forward as a very natural and logical evolutionary development of our nervous system in relation to its contemporary media surroundings. People would develop this new radio sense even quicker when they lived in the city, the article recounts, where the environment was bustling of broadcasts everywhere, of course. City dwellers would quickly develop the radio sense through a process that was envisioned as a kind of merging of media with the human sense, uh, neuroradio technogenesis. 
The idea of the radio sense and the intimate connection between the nerves and the radio was plausible and perhaps even commonsensical in the 1920s. It made sense, of course, because there had already been a much longer established wireless imaginary, a world, of brimming, a world brimming of vibratory energies. Long before radio waves and brain waves materialized as epistemic things in a laboratory, fiction writers, scientists, and engineers had speculated on the idea of thought energies or nerve radiation, encouraged by a new awareness of an all-encompassing electromagnetic spectrum. And um, especially around 1900, the reigning imaginary was of a vibrant world flooded by invisible oscillations, a world in which both the mental and the material were swimming in an ocean of ether, a world in which everything could be connected to everything, light, heat, sound, electricity, magnetism, and even thoughts. The imagined uh, radio sense mentioned in 1926 had long been in the making, we could say, as part of what Jennifer Gabris has called a spectral ecology, a thinking of mediation in terms of a spectrum, a thinking that allowed for fuzzy boundaries, a thinking that characterized our world with an atmospheric condition. This is, of course, what we mean when we speak of media ecologies, mediologies, media spheres, or media environments to describe a world of fuzzy boundaries, including the boundary between the inside and the outside of the head. Brain radio is thus the imaginary limit case for a media ecology, when everything is connected to everything and every thought is already recorded and immediately played back, a collapsing of mind into media. This idea is, of course, famously described in the diary of the psychiatric patient Daniel Paul Schreber, published in 1903, who thought his own nerves were part of an extended network and felt himself to be machine-like, receptive of vocal messages through wires that extended into his head. Schreber's nervous imaginaries were um, symptomatic delusions or visions about a world of fuzzy boundaries between thoughts and environment. These imagined brain radios or mind media were not limited to the diaries of mental patients. In image number two, dear listeners, we see the American engineer Archie Collins in 1902. Collins, a wireless telephony experimenter, published about the effect of electric waves on the human brain because he wanted to know what caused mental patients to be disturbed by approaching thunderstorms. Uh, he described a little girl who started shaking heavily, for example, when a storm was nearby. Somehow, he thought, human brains must be sensitive to the electric tension in the atmosphere. To test this, Collins inserted two needles into a freshly dissected brain and connected them to a telephone. The telephone would let him hear the sounds of brain cells affected by electricity. When a thunderstorm was then approaching his lab, Collins listened to his wired up brain. To his surprise, the brain made three strong hissing sounds, like the cooling of a piece of red hot metal quickly submerged in water. Ultimately, Collins' peculiar brain thunderstorm experiment turned into a now forgotten footnote uh, in science, but it shows how much the imaginary of electrical brain activity and its connection to the atmosphere was omnipresent in cultural and scientific discourses. There was definitely a feedback loop here between technical experimentation and theoretical speculation that cannot be straightforwardly categorized as scientific or fictional. Science and fiction have fuzzy boundaries in the world of mind media. This was also the observation of a psychiatrist in 1919 who reflected on mental patients that were reporting about mind invading machines. He observed that their reports of influencing machines, so-called influencing machines, must have been induced by the fast rising popularization of the sciences. The patients used all their newly gained technical knowledge to explain the functioning of the fantastic machines from which they were suffer suffering. 
This increasing popularization of the sciences is of course exemplified in picture number one in your hands. After the strange case of Jean dancing to the radio in her head, the article proceeded to connect this speculative new uh, radio sense to novel nerve research in European laboratories, where, according to the article, scientists had used modified radio equipment and managed to pick up brain waves broadcasted by the nervous system. Hence, while American reports spoke of radio sending messages that were allegedly directly picked up by human brains, European scientists used radio-like equipment to pick up messages off the brain. By mixing these two together, brain radio now really started to make sense. Here we are in an early 20th century world of fuzzy boundaries between mind and media, and a fuzzy scientific world that mixed engineering, nerve research, psychophysiology, and parapsychology, all with a new emphasis on mediating science to a larger public. In the 1920s and 1930s, nerve researchers indeed used vacuum tubes, the same that were used in radios, to amplify and record the minute changes in electrical activity in the nerves. This action could be made visible, but it could also be sonified. Active nerves could be made audible in the laboratory. Scholars made use of this performative quality of nerve research. They brought their visual and phonographic records to conferences and played them for public demonstration. Reporters immediately jumped on these exciting new experiments. They wrote about new ways of eavesdropping on the mind and predicted a future in which we could see and hear the brain at work. Um, scientists in turn played with this excitement and allowed listeners to hear their nerve recordings in uh, radio broadcasts. So they were invited to speak about their research on the radio. In image number three, we see an announcement of a broadcast of the brain's sound at an American radio station. The picture suggests that the girl might soon be wired up to record her nerve activity. According to the article, the listeners would hear over the radio, the sound of her brain at work. An active frame that would sound something like the patter of rain on a tin roof. Broadcasting these sounds of nerves over the radio fueled, of course, the imaginary of the wireless brain radio. Scientists accepted invitations by radio producers to talk about new electric research on the radio, and even if they emphasized, these scientists, that brains were in fact not like radios, they nevertheless reinforced the intuitive brain radio imaginary. More so, researchers actively started to use the language of messages and information to talk about nerves. Hence, when nerves were etherealized, we could say, in the 1920s and 1930s, this also meant that they were newly framed in the language of communication. But how communicative were nerves, really? How much did they tell us? In 1934, one famous public nerve scientist, the Nobel Prize winning Cambridge physiologist, um, Edgar Adrian, was invited to speak at the first International Congress of Electric Radio Biology. The Congress was held at the beautiful Doji's Palace in Venice and co-presided by nobody less than the famous radio pioneer Marconi himself. Adrian remarked, so Professor Adrian remarked, that at that very moment, many laboratories had excitingly started to interpret the electric changes uh, taking place in the brain um, through a new technology called EEG, but he emphasized that this research was exceptionally complex. Perhaps Professor Adrian had wanted to temper the high hopes of the conference visitors. Marconi had opened the conference um, by saying that the human brain was the most delicate instrument, better than any machine invented by man, better than radio, and that it thus must be able to receive messages at distances even greater than any mechanical transmitter. Professor Adrian, in turn, remained vague about what new nerve electrical measurements would actually tell us. After his lecture, there was a demonstration of the first and only EEG recorder then present in Italy, 
which was shown to produce visual records of brain waves. This event made an overwhelming impression on the audience at the conference, among whom were the futurist artists Filippo Marinetti and Pino Masnata. These futurists had already proposed a new art of radio, La Radia, that proclaimed to do away with theater and the radio studio and would, quote, follow the behavior of waves and subatomic particles, quote. After the Congress, Masnata was even more excited about new research into nerve recordings and projected a new purely wireless technology that would transmit, quote, vibrations of thought, unquote. Dear listeners, in this brief talk, the wireless imaginary and its brain radio have emerged through a web of encounters between nerve scientists, artists, mental patients, engineers, and radio producers. What we can also start to see through these events is that in a world flooded with waves, the modern subject itself was affected by these fuzzy boundaries. This subject could be differently constituted through the wireless imaginary. On the one hand, the limit case of brain radio allowed the overflowing of boundaries of thought and world, thus dissolving the subject. On the other hand, brain radio broadcasts could also serve the emergence of a new kind of subject, a subject with a brain and a brain subject, one that could be addressed by the radio. This latter, newly embrained subject becomes most clear, I think, in the final example of this talk. A scientist speaking on the radio about brains. This was one of the BBC's favorite public speaking scientists, Dr. William Gray Walter. Many times since the 1940s, the BBC invited Walter to talk about his pioneering brain research to the BBC radio listeners, who were fond of his voice and his personal way of addressing his audience. Walter's broadcasts are uh, hard to find today, so I have not been able to hear his radio voice yet. But I do have the transcripts of his radio shows. And in these talks, we hear Walter not just addressing the listener, but specifically addressing the listener's brain, your brain. As he asks, quote, have you ever stopped to think of that strange, dark, private world within your skull, where not 2,000, but 10,000 million little gray nerve cells live their separate lives in your brain? It's the signals they exchange which make <clears throat> you, just you, and no one else, as long as you live." Unquote. In his radio broadcasts, Walter performed little experiments on the brains of his listeners, asking them to shut their eyes, to imagine a scene or an object. He would then diagnose them with a particular brain profile according to the experiment. If you had imagined the scene very vividly, you were probably a person with few alpha brainwave, brainwave rhythms occurring in your brain, yet, if you couldn't get a clear picture at all, you were probably a non-visualist with persistent alpha brainwave activity. So hence, in his radio talk, Walter had in fact, we could say, attempted to perform a kind of brain scan on the radio. Walter would continue his public experiments with brainwaves for over 30 years. And it was in the year 1963 that a NASA press release announced the first successful transmission of brain waves via its relay satellite from Walters Neurological Institute in Bristol, England, to Minneapolis in Minnesota. This 1963 radiophonic experiment of brainwave broadcasting shows how little ethereal brain radio actually was. Brainwave recordings were sent by landline to a transmission station, radioed into the relay satellite in space, and from the satellite they were flashed to the US receiving station, which sent them onwards via landline to Minneapolis. These brainwaves were a little too slow to be transmitted correctly, and they were difficult to interpret. Yet, Walter 
when he had received uh, the waves, Walter promised in the future this method could be used for a long distance diagnosis of the human brain. Dear listeners, in the 20th century, promises and fantasies have been the structure of brain radio. And promises and fantasies still are the structure of a broader imaginary of brain media today, brain media with real effects in our current wireless world. I began this talk uh, by speaking um, about imaginaries, the thoughts that can be thought. I told you, you would not hear the sounds of five things I mentioned tonight. But, dear listeners, what did you hear when you imagined the sound of Jean dancing to the music in her brain? What did you hear when you imagined the sound of hissing hot metal submerged in cool water and the sound of rain falling down on a tin roof? How did you imagine the sound of the voice of the favorite scientist of the BBC? And how, dear listeners, do our brainwave sound when relayed from outer space today? <laughs> 